Right, I found the story of an hour. Okay, so just to reiterate, the things that you'll want for today is story of an hour, the PowerPoint. We don't need the whole PowerPoint because we already went through that, but you'll want to have it open up to the Marxist page. And, um, and I'll put all this stuff up as we're going to. Um, and then you'll want the chart to fill out because that's what we're going to work on today in order to try to get through that. Sure, all right. Okay. So um, I'm going to put us in this sharing mode. And I think what I'm going to start out with is we're, um, I want to remind ourselves about the Marxist theory. Okay, so let's, let's start there. And let me get into this sharing mode. This takes just a second. Sorry, guys. All right, does everybody see what I'm seeing? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so here we are. We're, we're going to be looking at our first one. And what we're going to do on the, is we're going to read the story. We're going to look through this Marxist theory, remind ourselves of what it was. And we kind of went through that last week. But then we're going to... Um, we're going to read story of an hour and I'll just read that together with you guys. And then we're going to work on filling out that first box on the sheet where we're just going to be looking for kind of talking through what it is you do to find these Marxist pieces and what would be the good quotes that you would pull if you were going to be writing on this talking about Marxism. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're going to yeah. kind of go through that process the first time, and then you guys can kind of mimic that same process going through. I think I'm giving you today and tomorrow for feeling good about this, and then you're doing another one. Okay, so eventually you're going to go through and fill out the whole thing, but I think we have two weeks for filling out this whole chart, and then after that, then we'll go into what those other ones look like and eventually writing our own. So, if you remember Karl Marx, who was he? You guys remember? Who was he yep. again? I know we talked about it last week. The communist philosopher. Okay. So, um, if you remember, one of the big, there were a lot of big questions we had to answer in order to really get through this. And the first thing that we said was that we had to talk about uh, who does this benefit? You know, who gets something out of this? And so we're going to look at things like we're going to look at classes. And we said for, for the literary purposes of this, we can look at those classes as being like um, literally like servant to, you know, owner kind of thing. Or you can look at this as even like male to female or something like that. Right? Right. And we're always talking about what holds someone to something in the material dialect, because according to Marx, it's all about money. That's what makes the world turn around, right? Is who has money, who has the power, who has the, um, you know, who are the owners versus who are not. Um, and we're also looking at an economic base for society. We're not talking about politics. We're not talking about laws or philosophy or religion. He said all of those things came as a result of this material thing. You know, who has the stuff? And, um, and we said that there was a cyclical nature to society because it's this idea that the people on the bottom are eventually going to get so frustrated being on the bottom that they're going to demand change. And that usually comes in the form of revolution. Um, and so when we're looking at a piece of literature, we're looking at, they can be at any point in that cycle. They might be at the point of revolution. They might be at the point where they're just on the verge of it. It could be that they're just finished with one. You know, so we have to think of that. It isn't that you're always gonna see the whole cycle. Sometimes you will. Um, and of course this concept that oppressed people will revolt until socialism exists. And socialism, we said, was sort of this idea that everybody works towards the common good, right? And that we all share equally in the gains. So that's a very, very basic concept of Marx. There's, we could get way, way, way deeper, but for, I think for the purposes of what we're doing, this is probably 
you know, if you have those basic ideas. And of course, here are the big questions. And this is what I want you to keep in your head as we read through the story, right? We have these questions. Who benefits? So when we tell this story, who gets something out of it? Right? And so you have to really think then, like as we're reading it, who's benefiting and what is the benefit that they get? Um, we have to think about the social class. It can be of the author. It can be of the various people in the story. And what do they represent? You know, why would somebody say that? And what values are being talked about here? And they can be reversed or reinforced, like we support the values that everybody has, or we could be subverting them. We could be saying, hey, we don't agree with the values that most people in this culture agree with. And of course, the interactions between those classes of people, those groups of people. Does everybody remember this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so keep that in the back of your head as we read. Um, I'm going to move us over to actually reading the story. So um, if you, one of the things that I would advise you do is as we're going through the story, I'm going to read it. I want you to think about, first of all, overall what the whole story means, because this is a little weird. Okay, it's only like two pages long. I'm sure you noticed that when I sent it to you. Um, it's, it's a pretty short piece. But um, I want you to think about um, what, what are the different people? Who do they represent? Why do the things happen that they do? And then, on and then take it to that next level of what do each one of these folks represent? Is that making sense to everybody? Yeah, I get what you're saying. Okay, so we're going to look at that. And I am going to pull up this story. I don't know if I have the same one as I sent to you. Does this look the same as yours? Or did you guys get the one that's more, looks like a... I got it. Does yours look like a common lit one? Yeah. Okay, yes. you don't need to worry about the questions or anything. We're only dealing with the text of the story. If you wanna look at the questions, you're more than welcome to. But um, here's the story of an hour by Kate Chopin. And I think I already talked to you, it's 1894 is when this was written, so that's something to keep in mind also. Knowing that Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with a heart trouble, great care was taken to break her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. It was her sister Josephine who told her in broken sentences, veiled hints that revealed and half concealing her husband's friend Richards was there too, near her. It was he who had been in the newspaper office when the intelligence of the railroad disaster was received when Brentley Mallard's name came to the list of killed. He had only taken the time to assure himself of its truth by a second tele telegram and had hastened to, first, to forestall any less careful, less tender friend in bearing the sad message. She did not hear the story as men, many women have heard the same with a paralyzed inability to accept its significance. She wept at once with sudden wild abandonment in her sister's arms. When the storm of grief had spent itself, she went away to her room alone. She would have no one follow her. There stood facing the open window, a comfortable roomy armchair into this she sank, pressed down by a physical exhaustion that haunted her body and seemed to reach into her soul. She could see in the open square before her house the tops of trees that were all a quiver with the new spring life. The delicious breath of rain was in the air. In the street below, a peddler was crying his wares. The notes of a distant song which someone was singing reached her faintly and countless sparrows were twittering in the eaves. There were patches of blue sky showing here and there through the clouds that had met and piled one above the other in the west facing her window. She sat with her head thrown back upon the cushion of the chair, quite motionless except when a sob came up in her throat and shook her as a child who has cried itself to sleep continues to sob in its dreams. 
She was young, with a fair, calm face, whose lines bespoke repression and even a certain strength. But now there was a dull stare in her eyes, whose gaze was fixed away off yonder on one of those patches of blue sky. It was not a glance of reflection, but rather indicated a suspension of intelligent thought. There was something coming to her, and she was waiting for it, fearfully. What was it? She did not know. It was too subtle and elusive to name, but she felt it creeping out of the sky, reaching toward her through the sounds, the scents, the color that filled the air. Now her bosom rose and fell tumultuously. She was beginning to recognize this thing that was approaching to possess her, and she was striving to beat it back with her will, as powerless as her two white slender hands would have been when she abandoned herself, a little whispered word escaped her slightly parted lips. She said it over and over until under the breath, free, free, free. The vacant stare and the look of terror that had followed it went from her eyes. They stayed keen and bright. Her pulses beat fast and the coursing blood warmed and relaxed every inch of her body. She did not stop to ask if it were or were not a monstrous joy that held her. A clear and exalted perception enabled her to dismiss the suggestion as trivial. She knew that she would weep again when she saw the kind, tender hands folded in death, the face that had never looked save with love upon her, fixed and gray and dead. But she saw beyond that bitter moment a long procession of years to come that would belong to her absolutely. And she opened and spread her arms out to them in welcome. There would be no one to live for during those coming years. She would live for herself. There would be no powerful or no powerful will on, ugh, sorry. There would be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe they have the right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. A kind intention or a cruel intention made, it the, made the act seem no less a crime as she looked upon it in that brief moment of illumination. And yet she had loved him. Sometimes. Often she had not. What did it matter? What could love, the unsolved mystery, count for in the face of this possession of self-assertion which she suddenly recognized as the strongest impulse of her being? Free, body and soul free, she kept whispering. Josephine was kneeling before the closed door with her lips to the keyhole, imploring for admission. Louise, open the door, I beg, open the door. You will make yourself ill. What are you doing, Louise? For heaven's sake, open the door. Go away. I am not making myself ill. No, she was drinking in the very elixir of life through that open window. Her fancy was running riot along those days ahead of her, spring days and summer days and all sorts of days that would be her own. She breathed a quick prayer that life might be long. It was only yesterday she had thought with a shudder that life might be long. She arose at length and opened the door to her sister's importunities. There was a fe feverish triumph in her eyes, and she carried herself unwittingly like a goddess of victory. She clasped her sister's waist, and together they descended the stairs. Richard stood waiting for them at the bottom. Someone was opening the front door with a latch key. It was Brentley Mallard, who entered, a little travel stained, composedly carrying his grip sack and umbrella, he had been far from the scene of the accident and did not even know there had been one. He stood amazed at Josephine's piercing cry, at Richard's quick motion to screen him from the view of his wife. When the doctors came, they said she had died of heart disease, of the joy that kills.
So that's the story. So I think first we have to break down what happened in the story. Somebody help me out here. Her husband died. Well, she thought her husband died. Oh. Right? So the very ending there, her husband was Brentley Mallard, and that's who came in through the end. Okay. Okay, so he came in, and he hadn't been in the train accident. And then who died? She did. She died. She died when she saw him walk through that door. So that's the main event, right? She's told that her husband died. She goes up to her room. She comes down. Her husband is seen, or she sees her husband. He's actually fine. And she probably had a heart attack, right? died of heart disease of the joy that kills so she has like some sort of a heart problem and then she dies so but what is the story actually about like that's the events um i don't i don't really know the main point but it was kind of leaning towards the fact that she was happy that her husband passed away or she thought she was happy that she thought he passed away. Yes. Yeah, she she, free basically. Yeah. Yeah. The, this free, free, free body and soul free. Right. So um, if I'm looking at this, this is one of the pieces I'm noticing right here. Right. Is that she says free body and soul free. Right. I'm looking at that time period, it makes sense. Okay, so that's something that that we have to think about. What is she feeling when she finds, and we also have to think, so what type of relationship do you think that these two had with each other? Um, probably not a very good one. I'd say like a really one-sided relationship. Or like controlling. Okay, so so there's something to do with control, and and we I think we can get that from the fact that she says free, free, free. Right. Right, because that's how she's feeling. Um. But let's look, like if if people had, how did she feel about him? How did what are our indications of how he felt about? her i don't think this was like a some sort of abusive relationship or anything like that no be more like a so let's look in the text let's back this up in the text look on this this part um let's look at this paragraph that starts with she did not stop to ask if it were not a monstrous joy that held her read those next two paragraphs and tell me what you think after you What do you guys see in those paragraphs that might be important? There would be no one to live for during those coming years. Okay, there would be no one to live for during, during those coming years. She would live for herself, right? That would be, okay. that, would be that whole sentence there. That's a pretty telling sentence. Um, so that lets us know something about how she's feeling about 
his loss. Um, do we have anything more that tells us something more about how did he treat her? So there would be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe they have the right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. Hmm. Yeah, that's important. I feel Look like at the previous paragraph. Let's let's get a feel for though it how he was. And I think you're right. I think you're going into a really good place there, Connor, but Because I'm looking at this one. She knew she would weep again when she saw the kind, tender hands folded in death. The face that had never looked save with love upon her. What does that even mean? What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so this is, this is one of those moments where we're sort of perplexed, right? And where we have to kind of define what is really happening in this story. She's, you're right, she's free. She is happy. He is gone. But she said she knew that she would weep again when she saw, so when she goes to the funeral, right? When she sees her dead husband, she's going to do what? Cry. She's going to cry. She's going to yeah. weep. That's that overwhelming crying, can't control yourself crying. When she saw the kind, tender hands folded in death, the face that had never looked save with love upon her. What does that tell us about their relationship? Was he terrible to her? No. No. He was kind, he was tender, and never looked on her with anything but love. Why is that such a hard thing for us to accept? This is her husband. He treated her well. He was always kind to her. He was always nice to her. He always loved her. What's hard about this then? Is it because of the time period? Yes, yeah, we have this issue with the fact that if he's this good of a guy, why is she so happy? Right. Dead. Is this making sense to everybody? Not really. Okay, so, so then we have to say, well, why? Why is she happy she's dead? And then I think we get that next peace we have to think about what is it she's not like he's gone he's gone he's gone what is it she's excited to be For on her own free yeah there would be no one to live for during those coming years she would live for herself and i think you're right we have to then think about what year is this late 1800s late 1800s what if we think about what is her problem with being married to this guy what is the problem what does she not want this uh, serve a male her whole life I guess serve, her hus serve a husband her whole life she, she doesn't want a husband Right. It's not really that there's anything really wrong with Brentley Mallard. He's not the problem. He was a good guy. There's right. nothing wrong with him. He treated her well. He did everything he was supposed to do. The issue is they're having an issue with the, the institution of being married to a guy in 1894. Right. Right. Okay. Because was the thing about this was in that time period was there much in a woman's a woman's life at that point 
that was didn't have something to do with her husband. Like if you were to ask her, oh, hey, you know, what do you do? How's your day? Pretty much everything in that story of her life would have been in some sort of relation to her husband. Like, oh, I stay home and take care of our kids. I do this for him. Um, I get to go out shopping because he gets the money to go out and do the shopping. Like everything that you do would never be completely independent. Like the husband's relationship would somehow come into that. And if you think about it, when she was young, who had the power? Herself. Her parents, right? Oh, wait, like yeah, her yeah. parents would have taken care of her. They bought her food, they bought her clothing, they gave her this, they did that. You know, that's what would happen. And then for a woman in this time period, the next step is getting married. Mm -hmm. And you sort of have to. Why? Because they don't work. They don't have jobs back then. Yeah. Right. So if you're going to have food and you're going to have... Um, you're going to have a place to live and everything like that. You're going to get married. What, a, what is she now? If he had died, if he had actually died, what would have been her statue, her stature in society? A widow. A widow. Now, as a widow, what happens? I don't know. She would have taken all of his stuff she'd keep her house she'd keep the money she'd keep all of that sort of thing until she got country. married again same sort. so now she is actually capable of sort of taking care of herself now if those funds run out then you saw that that churches and different people would help to support a widow you know what i mean so mm -hmm. so that's something that would have happened but right now it doesn't seem like they're all that worried about money or anything like that and right now she's just thinking, I can be in charge of me. Right. That's something that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So then why does she die at the end? Because when she sees her husband, she realizes that that's not going to happen for her. Yeah. yeah. All of that is gone. Is this starting to make a little more sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that brings us, of course, to our next phase, right? Um, and that's for us to think about, again, and this is where you might wanna have both your, your PowerPoint out and your story of an hour, right? And I'm searching for our, here it is. So if we're looking at the worksheet, right, that we're supposed to be doing, our critical theory here is Marxist. And so what is the big thing that we need to answer about Marxist theory? Power. Okay, and power is equal to what? Money. To money and stuff. I'm just going to say that for right now. Okay, and we also need to see, we also have to think about what do the characters represent. Does that make sense? So I'm just putting that there so I don't forget what I'm doing on this one. Does that make sense? Like you yes. don't have to do it exactly this way. I'm just putting it there so I remember what it is that shows this. So do we see where money and stuff has something to do with the way that, or that has something to do with this story? How does money and power and stuff, I think actually we might have to start here with what do the characters represent? So if we're talking about Mrs. Mallard, right? Right. What, 
what does she represent? What class of people might she represent or be a symbol of in this story? Um, lower class. Well, she is, but why is she kind of lower class? Because she doesn't technically make the money. And that is because she is what? A woman. She's the wife, right? Right. Specifically, this is, this is looking at she is the wife. What does Mr. Mallard What does he represent? Person who makes the money, the husband. Okay, he is the husband and he makes the money. So if we know that, we already have answered some of our stuff, right? He is the one with the money. He is the one that has, he's the one who has the power. Now that isn't even something he necessarily asked for. It is just who he is. He was born a man. And since he was born a man, he is part of that class. And he's the one who has the power because she was born a woman, especially in this time frame, she was expected to get married and to be completely, to wrap her whole life around him. So when he dies, right, in that power structure, we're in that midst of that power structure being turned around, or when she thinks he's dead, what quotes could I use that would support saying that this, this structure has imposed something negative? Okay, what do you mean? So if I were going to say, like, um, what was the thing that really bugged us? That he... No. She couldn't take care of herself. That what? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Jocelyn. That she couldn't take care of herself. Is that really in the story? That's something we understand from the story, but is that really written in the story? Um, I guess the thing that bugged us was that he wasn't a bad husband. Okay, so Mr. Mallard was not a bad husband. In fact, we could even use as a quote in there, what is a quote that supports that? That she the one about him loving her and the tender hands or whatever. Okay, so we would insert that quote in there. And I can't flip-flop screens just because of this, right? So he was not a bad husband. And then we would insert the quote. Right. Right? But what's the, what's the big issue? Now she has a now she has the power. I don't know. That now it's like flipped, it's like Okay, so but when he died, what was her reaction? Sad. At was first. That? She at was first. at first. At first. Right. And then but she as was as soon happy. as she was alone, what was she saying? Free. She was free. She was happy. Right? I think she said actually free, free, free. And that right there is going to be what I can have for my quotes. Now, over in this section, now that I've thought about it in this way, right? And I've said he was not a bad husband, and then I'm going to insert my quote there. But when he died, she was happy to be free, free, free. I've got two good quotes. But now I have to explain why this class thing, right? Husband versus wife. 
1894, the power that a man, not that he necessarily asked for it or he was a jerk about it or anything like that, but when we see a man has the ability to completely control his wife through money, through status, through, right? That's the stuff. Mostly we're talking about money here. He's the one who pays the bills. He's the one who owns the house. He's the one who gives her money if she wants to go shopping, right? He has the power in all of those cases. How, how does that turn into the fact that she feels that way? And that's your explanation. Is this making sense to you? Yes. Okay. So this is what you're doing as you're going through. It's going to be the same story the whole time. Okay. So you don't have to have a new story. You don't have to try to figure it out again and again and again with a new story each time. But what you're going to do is go back and you're going to say, oh yeah, new historicism. What was that? My couple little notes of things that I might see or that I should be looking for, right? That say that this is new historicism. And then you're going to say, well, I see this new historic. I need see something through this lens. Here's my quotes or my examples from the story. And then I'm going to explain what those mean. So if I were over here, I might say, Mrs. Mallard, has what seems to be um, a, what's a good explanation? What's her, be an inappropriate reaction to the death of her kind husband? Yeah. The reality of this, because he is her husband, and therefore controls her life, her money, etc. I'm just going to put down, right? Because that's a long list we can make. Mm -hmm. Which she longs to be free from. It is not that he was bad, but the society, I guess, the whole, I don't know how to explain that, but yeah, I get you. Societal here. expectations, maybe? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of marriage. And this um, you know, this, the societal expectations of marriage put her in a place put her or made her powerless. Yes. And that can be what my explanation is. And then maybe I'll go back and fix my spelling, you know? <laughs> But that's what I'm looking for you to do is then, because now I've, I've shown clearly how her, that the, the fact that the society has put these characters and we have a wife being and a husband and their power situation, and it's really only their power situation that is a problem. And as a result, she doesn't even right? She doesn't even want to be with her husband. And right. so that's, that's a problem. And it's nothing that poor Mr. Mallard even did. So
So do you guys feel a little bit better about what I'm asking you to do in this? Yeah, I feel a little bit better. Okay. Um, so that's kind of what you're doing. And then like, you'll just go to the next one, um, which is new historicism. And I believe I have you doing that on Thursday. Am I correct? Um, yeah, I think according so. to the thing, I think you're doing that on Thursday. So you have today and tomorrow to kind of look through this and start thinking, well, what would I do for new historicism and how would that one work? What would be the examples that I could use from there? And um, we'll be able to get together on Tuesday and I believe you have new historicism and one other one, whatever the next one is after that. I'm not looking at the sheet right now. Um, so if you have questions or you're like, I really didn't get this, you know, come and talk to me, ask me, send me questions. Um, I'm always here. Um, so does that all make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay, I know this is new material and everything, but um, but I think that I think you guys can do it. You're you're smart. So, all right, I have used a ton of your time. I really miss you, and I really wish we were going to all be together. But I guess we're not. Have they heard anything more about things like uh, prom or anything?